Good evening. My name is Toby Crawford Connor, and I am the Vice President of the Sullivan Sorrento History Historical Society, and I'll be your presenter tonight on the topic of Duaquet. This is about the Acadian history of Upper Frenchman Bay. This is something that I researched for school this past semester, and I hope to continue working on it because it's so interesting to me. So welcome to History Hour. Tonight's presentation will be recorded for those who can't make it, and it will be added to our YouTube channel later. There's a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to be moving quickly. We'll be taking questions at the end, so please keep yourselves muted. You can also put questions into the chat box if you're afraid you might forget them as we go along. Let's begin with the first people to live here. That's the Wabanaki. This land is unceded Wabanaki territory and we honor that. This area was frequented by the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot. Maps showing their territories usually included this as Passamaquoddy territory, but other maps show that it was shared. Uh, it's from their language, the Passamaquoddy language, that the name derives. But it is known that this was an area used for trading, gatherings, and hunting by both tribes, and the use goes back many thousands of years. You can see from these maps of Wabanaki archaeological sites that they're um, lit up like the recent power outage map will be tomorrow. <laughs> Hopefully not. But um, they didn't live in all of these spots at once. They were a very mobile people and sites were used seasonally and for different purposes. So the largest known sites according to excavations that have been done have been around Sorrento and Flanders Bay here. There's also one at uh, Butler's Point. And of course, you see the many, many other ones which we don't need to go digging for more because we know, yes, this was Wabanaki land. Now we're looking at the various names associated with this area. Today we call it Waki. Uh, the French called it Duwakit. The English called it Adawakit. And these were all taken from a Passamaquoddy name for the place, which was Adwakiski which means a came or horseback, not, not actual horses because they weren't here, but the shape uh, where the water runs out very strong. Uh, so here you can see variations of the name used by the French and English. Um, they all vary quite a bit in the spelling. You see les uh, duakes, duaket, aduaket, there's Duakesk. They're all pronounced the same, essentially, um, despite the many varied spellings. And then there's uh, just a note on the current name we use uh, to refer to this area, which is Waking. This uh, first appeared with the New England settlers who came up around six, uh, 1760. Uh, the word Waking means seal in Abenaki or Akik in um, Passamaquoddy. And there was an island off southern Maine that was referred to as Waki at some point back uh, during that time. And the new settlers pro probably went with that name because it, sound, it was familiar and it, and it sounded similar to this uh, Waki name that they were used to. Though in taking this on, they did lose the original, the, the meaning of the original name. So Waukeg is actually a colonized version of the original name, which was Had Waukeski. This map shows the geographic point from which the name derives, and that is False Point here in Sullivan. It's a sandy glacial came that curves out into the river, forcing the tidal falls through. So um, that's the feature that this area was named for by the Wabanaki thousands of years ago. Um, the name has continued to be used by the French and the English, and today 
in its current form Waukee. Now we're in Acadia. This is a basic map. It shows the boundaries of French Acadia and you can see it extended to Penobscot Bay, which is where Pentagoet was, which is a modern day Castine. The border was disputed because the French, um, for a while, they insisted that the Western Acadia border was at Pimaquid and the English uh, said no, their border is further, <laughs> further east. And so this area was fought over for <laughs> pretty much the entire time of its existence, exchanged back and forth between the English seven or eight times. And um, before it opened to Protestant settlement in 1759, this was pretty much the wild east it's inhabited by um, the Acadians and Wabanaki. And then, of course, the boundary between Maine and Nova Scotia or New Brunswick now, that wasn't settled until well after 1800. Where exactly was Duwakit? It wasn't just at Falls Point or Sorrento. Um, but a helpful bit of information comes from the Lamb Grant given to Cadillac in 1688 when he was made Seigneur de Duarquet et Mont Desert or Lord of Duarquet and Mount Desert. And this 1702 map by Franklin was made with that in mind. And you can see Duarquet labeled as the land there in the center. You see the river Duaquet, which would be the Sullivan River, and Duaquet Point, Point Duaquet, that would be Sorrento. And then just to the right of that, you can see Point Escude, which is Scudic Point. So uh, the French and English of this time, when they referred to Duaquet, they usually were referring to Upper Frenchman Bay around Sullivan Harbor and the land thereon. Here are a few examples of early French and English maps showing the place. Um, keep in mind that cartography was relative at the time. Um, so none of this is accurate to what we consider accurate uh, maps today. But uh, you can see on some of these um, you see the dots there indicating French and Wabanaki missions right in this area. You have the 1734 map showing uh, potential French villages on uh, either side of um, Sullivan Harbor, That's one at uh, Crabtree Neck potentially, and one in Sorrento. And now we're looking at a drawing made of Pentagoet in seven, uh, 1670. This was at modern day Castine. Pentagoet was the capital of French Acadia from 1670 to 1674. And this is part of the time period that we'll be focusing on. Uh, um, Jean Vincent d'Abadie de Saint Castine was already established here at this point. He um, set up his trading house um, maybe around 1667 or so thereabouts. He was trading with the Wabanaki. Um, he was made ensign of the fort here when Jacques de Chambly was made governor of Acadia in 1673. And trading was the biggest appeal of the area because of the value of all of the furs and peltry is what they called it, the trade with the Wabanaki and also the, between New England settlers and the Wabanaki and French. This uh, back and forth trade was very common. And this little map that I made shows where Pentagoet was in relation to Duaquet and the route that would have been taken by the locals with the Wabanaki and French um, for quick 
and safe access between the two. It go from Pentagoet um, through Egamagan Reach into Blue Hill Bay, and then the Mount Desert Narrows, and then you would be at Duaket. And you can see here the advantageous position that um, Duaket was in because uh, it was tucked back from there, they could see any ships approaching from around Mount Desert Island, any attacking English ships. Um, and they could also see out into the open ocean, as you can see um, indicated on the lower right hand side, that is access to the open ocean. And they could do all this without being seen because of the various little islands and things that were um, covered in trees. So they were quite protected and hidden back in there. And it's no surprise that this would become a safe harbor for um, Acadian and Wapanaki operations for years to come. To understand some of the following events that took place, we have to look at what was going on back in Europe at the time. And that was the Franco-Dutch War and the Third Anglo-Dutch War. They were fighting over land, of course, and uh, Prince William of Orange was involved and Louis XIV of France. They were the monarchs at play. And actually the French and English allied themselves against the Dutch for the first two years, which is important to us. And you'll soon see why. And the English and Dutch, they did sign a treaty of peace. That was the Treaty of Westminster in the summer of 1674. Um, all of these things bring us to the following events. Um, is the Dutch Corsair or buccaneer, privateer, pirate, uh, Urian Arnotes. This was also during the golden age of piracy where naval warfare and plundering were rampant on the high seas. Arnotes was based out of Curaçao and he was commissioned by the governor there to head north to attack French and English ships since the Dutch were at war with them. And he did this happily. Um, he captured a few ships on his way north, but by the time he arrived in New York in July 1674, he learned that the English and Dutch had made peace with that treaty and that New Amsterdam was given back to the English, which upset him a great deal. He had been looking forward to continuing his plundering and now uh, he was uh, missed the boat, so to speak. But in Boston, he met with a Massachusetts fur trader named John Rhodes. And Rhodes told him about Acadia, about the bounties there. And he was familiar with it since he had gone there as a trader. So he volunteered as a pilot uh, for Arnutz and said, that Acadia isn't really um, defended. And since the Dutch and French are still at war, well, we can go and plunder that all we want. So um, Arnutz uh, raised a company of men from Boston. This is mo lo mostly local, local men. And um, of course, some of his crew that he brought up um, they headed out and uh, in his ship, the Flying Post Horse, and they took Pentagoet. It uh, took about an hour for them to capture the fort. Some accounts say less than two hours, but I've seen um, more primary sources saying about an hour. Uh, they took Chambly prisoner and they took St. Castine, but not before torturing him with brimstone matches, um, probably burning him on his feet and such. So um, Arnutz, he placed bottles in the ground, declaring 
that this land was now New Holland. They went on to take the French forts at Machias and Jemseg on the St. John River. And one neat uh, coincidence is that on the same day or around the same day that um, this Dutch pirate was taking uh, Pentagouet, back in Europe, the French and Dutch engaged in the Battle of Seneff over French Flanders. And um, that was the bloodiest battle of that war with something like 25,000 men dead. And uh, back in Boston, Arnott's, he sold his loot, including one of the cannons from Pentagouet. He stayed there in port long enough for his ship to be repaired and readied up. And during that time, he was approached by a few New England fur traders who wanted to know if they could still go to the eastward to trade. And he said no, because the furs are too valuable to the Dutch. And um, at this point, he, he made up, uh, he crafted up a document, not exactly legal. Uh, in that document, he granted his three captains that he had chosen the right to patrol the coast of New Holland and seize any ships they found. And these three men, they were John Rhodes, uh, Peter Rodrigo, also known as the Flanderkin, and Cornelius Anderson. He left, um, our notes, he left most of his men there in Boston and took off back to Curacao, where he would engage in more piratic acts. The men under the captains were mostly locals, and they came up with two small ships to use for their uh, purpose of guarding the coast of New Holland. Um, the first ship was a catch, the Edward and Thomas. Um, that was something that Thomas Mitchell, one of the men, he owned it partly, so that was easy enough to come up with. The other ship was something they had to hire on credit, and they called that the Penobscot Shallop, which is sort of a flat, um, open, smaller boat. They split their 10 men between the two ships. You can see on the Edward and Thomas, there's Captain Rodrigo, John Rhodes, etc. And um, we'll see what they do next. Here is just a quick map showing the activities of these pirates. Um, starting with the killing of sheep um, belonging to George Munjoy at uh, Peaks Island off Casco Bay there, down near Portland. Uh, they seized a couple of vessels just east of Pentagouet. Uh, the first one they let go, uh, the second one, which was uh, Waldron's ship, they took the peltry from and then sent him on his way. Then the next one we see is in a familiar place. That was where they attacked and seized George Manning's ship, which was a larger ship, a bark. And um, this is the big event that we're going to talk about right now. On December 4th, 1674, George Manning was anchored at Duwakit doing his trade with the Wabanaki and Acadians, and he found himself suddenly cornered by the Dutch ship, captained by Rodrigo, the Flanderkin. Um, you could see in the bay there, it'd be very easy to corner a ship. <laughs> uh, so Rodrigo, he boarded Manning's ship. Things were tense, but relatively civil at first. And that all changed when, um, Manning had Rodrigo down in the cabin looking at the goods and papers and things. And Manning, he had two small pistols in a cuddy. He got them and was handing one to his mate, James DeBeck, when one of Rodrigo's crew poked in and saw them with the guns in their hands. And he cried out to Rodrigo, watch yourself. So this alarmed everyone, and they ran up on deck 
and after a moment of confusion, they had their pistols drawn, all of them, their pistols drawn and leveled at each other, and it stated that um, in the depositions that Manning had a blunderbuss, and he had that, uh, he tried to light it, but in the excitement, wasted the spark, could not get it to fire, so at that point, the pirates all fired their pistols, and Manning was shot through the hand, and no one else was injured, which makes you wonder about the accuracy of those um, shots. So um, then Manning's mate, James DeBeck, he's a young man, he's dragged aboard Rodrigo's ship, and Rodrigo proceeds to beat him in the skull. And when DeBeck raises his arms over his head to protect himself from the blows, Rodrigo slices his elbow open with his cutlass. Um, both men, they have to beg for their lives, and they're given the chance to either be left wounded in September on a rocky island with nothing to eat but tree roots, or to go along as the pirate uh, prisoners. Um, because either way, the pirates were going to take that ship. So these guys, they, they chose to live. And so the pirates take their bark, put Dutch flags on it, and add it to their group. And just to illustrate the importance of ship size here, the pirates' ships, their two original ships were small. They had a ketch and a shallop. And Manning, in the ship they captured, he was in a bark. It was much larger. It was owned by the wealthy Boston merchant John Freak. It was a very well-equipped ship with a lot of room to hold a great deal of goods for trading. So the capture of this ship was pretty significant for the pirates, as it made them look a lot more legitimate with that um, bark and the Dutch colors flying from it, in addition to their two smaller ships. When the group sailed on, they took another ship on the St. John River and kept the Frenchmen from that on as uh, prisoners with Manning's company. And through the French prisoners, Manning was able to get a letter out to Boston, to John Freak, the owner of the ship, he told him what happened, um, the current situation, and that uh, he needed to send help straight away. Here I think it's important or, or worthwhile to discuss John Freak a little bit. He was a very wealthy and powerful person in Boston. He came over from England with a ton of money. He owned a swath of warehouses and wharves in Boston Harbor with his partner, Captain Scarlet. And he did challenge the Puritan's way of thinking because he was a man of luxury and excess. As you can see by his portrait there, um, portraits of Puritans from that period are not <laughs> very common at all, but uh, John Freaky had many portraits done of he and his family. So those are pretty notable. And uh, he wrote, once he got Manning's letter, he wrote to the court there, which you can see a snippet of. He wrote uh, describing the piratical accounts and uh, pleaded for immediate help in recovering his ship, his men, and his goods. And Boston sent out Captain Samuel Mosley to capture the pirates from their end, but uh, in the meantime, the French were already on the hunt for them. The French merchant, Henri Brunet, was traveling with Saint Castine, and uh, they were actually searching for the French not long, or the Dutch, I'm sorry, searching for the pirates not long after the attack that was uh, made on Manning. This is from a letter Brunet sent uh, dated December 13th, 1674. 
and in it he writes they are buccaneers who have deserted their captain after the capture of Pentaguit. Although I have not arrested them, I have done my best to find them, for I had picked up three to four Frenchmen to accompany me. I have St. Castine with the ensign of the fort, and I have helped him. He will not fail to surprise them, and I venture to assume that he will capture them and will be heard about a great deal. So that was a very a prophetic um, mention about uh, the uh, legend that uh, St. Castine would go on to become in the years immediately following this. And, and just to explain, um, so earlier, the August before, St. Castine had been captured by the Dutch but he escaped at some point and made his way up to Quebec. And uh, there Frontenac gave him um, a mission to um, unite the Wabanaki um, with the French against the English. And we'll hear more about that down the line. So the pirates, they were captured, of course. Uh, this was uh, sometime in March, where Samuel Mosley is sailing to the eastward, and he encounters a French ship, the St. Castine aboard. I'm not sure if that was uh, Brunet's ship at that point or another one that he had um, acquired, that they teamed up in their search to go after the pirates. Um, they surrounded the three pirate ships near Machias where um, they had set up a trading post or a trading house. And as the French and English ships drew near, Manning seized the opportunity to turn his ship, still flying the Dutch flags, uh, turn it against the pirates and start firing at close range. So the pirates quickly surrender and mostly has St. Castine do the honors of seizing all of the booty from the pirates um, while mostly goes and fetches uh, one of the, their men, one of the pirates who is still on shore at Machias. And they take them all to Boston as prisoners to be held on trial for piracy. Trial in Boston, it's a huge deal. The, the events of the pirates, these were traitorous and scandalous, and especially because most of the pirate crew were homegrown. And it was an eventful trial too. Uh, one day while in session, John Freak and Captain Scarlet were aboard one of their ships inspecting the cargo, and this was within um, site of the tr of the um, courthouse and there was a freak explosion on deck no pun intended which killed John Freak instantly and Captain Scarlet lived long enough to draw up a will during which he left a massive sum of money to a church in Boston and a library among many other things and um, also present at the trial was uh, Increase Mather. You see his portrait here. He was the Puritan clergyman, most known for his association with the Salem witchcraft trials and being the father of Cotton Mather. But um, he was there and he preached a very long hanging sermon prior to the sentences of death being handed out. He would become known for these hanging sermons, as would his son uh, down the line. So all of the men but Anderson were sentenced to death, and they were able to appeal that successfully after execution was repeatedly delayed because of the outbreaks of outbreak of um, King Philip's War. Uh, they so they commuted 
most of their sentences to banishment instead, except for John Rhodes. Um, they upheld his sentence of death, and he had to sit in prison another year before they finally let him out because of the ongoing wars with the Native Americans. Here you can see the mark of uh, Captains Peter Rodrigo and Cornelius Anderson from their testimony. It's interesting to see um, the Dutch, the Flanderkin and the Dutch pirates. So all of this, that is why Flanders Bay is so called, but why has it been such a mystery? Um, when I was researching this, I found in older texts, um, they would associate the name with an incident of little interest or an unfortunate skirmish, things like that, but never went into detail or um, addressed any of the specifics. So it's actually understandable why it was sort of swept under the rug. For one, it's uh, quite shameful to have homegrown pirates from Puritan, Massachusetts. These were supposedly Puritan pirates who were attacking <laughs> other Puritan ships. So that's something they um, would not be proud of. And another thing is that these pirates, they were not executed as they would have been, and they weren't actually banished either um, because of the King's, King Philip's war within a year of their release, you see a lot of them out um, sailing with their former captain, captors um, against the Wabanaki. Like, uh, for instance, you see uh, Cornelius Anderson. He's partnered with Samuel Mosley um, in raids up in Maine. So um, it was not a proud moment. Any of these things were not proud things for early American history. The historians tend to romanticize and place the early colonial founders and these Puritans and pilgrims on um, pedestals. And this story, none of this fit in with that. So um, the origin story of the name Flanders Bay that popped up in the 19th century about the shipwrecked pilgrim, that sounded a lot better, though it certainly was not based on any bit of fact. Continuing on, St. Castine with his new commission from Frontenac, he got busy organizing attacks on the English with the Wabanaki. He was fluent in the language. He was married before long to uh, one of the daughters of the great chief Madakawando. And the Wabanaki Confederacy was being established around this time. And as the King Philip's War spread up into our coasts, we find George Manning again, this time as part of the Northeast Coast Campaign of 1677. So Manning, through other of his letters to the court that I found, he'd asked several times to be relieved of duty for just about every excuse, mostly that he wanted to be home with his wife and family. He seemed to be pretty tired of all of this um, sailing and fighting. And Taking that into account, we have his journal from his journey here, in particular focusing on the events of August 7th through the 9th of 1677. Now he's supposed to be on the hunt for French and Wabanaki ships. He's familiar with Duaquet, given his trading history. He probably knows some of the folks here somewhere. He approaches Duaquette and meets another ship uh, with some Frenchmen on board. And then he sees another ship behind them that disappears as he's interrogating the Frenchmen. So he goes up closer to the mouth of Taunton River and he sees a canoe paddling. 
it, the canoe sees him and disappears back into the land. So he continues going closer um, into the mouth of Taunton River and up the river. He sees a sail coming down the river, heading out. And uh, so he knows there's some stuff going on in here. And after struggling with the wind a bit, he uh, finally goes after in chase up the river. Now, the ship that he is following, <laughs> uh, they seem to have have things planned out. They nearly succeed in having Manning and his ship dashed on the rocks at Tidal Falls, something he calls a cruel and most formidable place. He follows the ship into Taunton Bay and what he refers to as a stout skirmish ensues, but he's been tricked again. The Wabanaki and French, they bring their vessel close to shore in a strategic area. It's low tide and they get out and run up the rocks and into the woods. And Manning finds himself stuck there in his ship with no wind and he can do nothing but wait for the next tide. So time goes by, the French and Wabanaki return to their ship after dinner, you know, no big deal. <laughs> and they sit there with their ships next to each other, this kind of lazily firing off shots now and then uh, until two or 3 a.m. when the tide comes in and Manning is able to push off because he, he doesn't want to be stuck <laughs> in this bay anymore. It's, uh, it's scary to him. He feels trapped. So he sails uh, that night closer to MD, MDI and spends the night there next to the island. And come the next morning, he sees a couple other ships headed to Duake, uh, but he's facing the wrong direction with a wind. The wind was a real problem right now, this time of year. So he, he wants to go after him, but he can't. He sits for a while waiting for some wind, but then the fog settles in, it starts to get dark, and he says, um, well, that's enough of that, and he sails back home to Boston. So this illustrates the kind of vibe <laughs> and the setting of Duaquette as a French guerrilla base and the status it would hold for the next 75 years. Um, it is probably one of the earliest accounts of um, Europeans uh, coming into uh, uh, contact with the Tidal Falls here and um, uh, Taunton Bay itself. So that's really interesting. <clears throat> so I do have to mention Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac, even though he was not a very nice person. He did create the Signory of Duaquet and Mount Desert. And a century later, his granddaughter came over from France, uh, France <laughs> to get away from the French terror that was underway leading up to the French Revolution. And she laid claim to the original land grant and had the backing of Revolutionary War hero Lafayette. So this was granted, though she only got the eastern half of MDI and the land up to Sullivan, which you can see the French line on the 1803 maps by James Peters of Sullivan. And there's more to that for another time. So we're back in Acadia and Saint Castine is returned to France in 1701 to settle his estate. And he's left his three Metis sons behind they are Bernard Anselm, Joseph, and Bonas. In 1703, following a brutal attack by an English privateer, the Wabanaki and French at Pentagouet relocate to their safe haven of Duaquet, where they remain for the next several years. Here, Anselm and Alexandre de Belle Isle, who was a grandson of de la Tour. They and their mixed families camped out while the English waged war against him. They were pretty safe, tucked back in, in Upper Frenchman Bay. Um, and then in uh, 1710, we find mention of Anselm. He was hosting John Livingston, who was kind of an ambassador 
He was requesting his help to deliver news of Port Royal's surrender to the English uh, to Quebec. And um, St. Castine was the ideal candidate because he was also a sort of ambassador between the English and French and Wabanaki. And he also was very familiar with uh, the area getting up to Quebec and back without any trouble. So um, while Livingston was at St. Castine's house, which is at Duaquet or current day Sorrento, he reported very civil and friendly treatments with plenty of food, native dancing, song, and a comfortable bed. Um, in 1714, Anselm went to France to settle his father's estate, and uh, this left Joseph in charge. When the English declared war again in 1723, Joseph, uh, he had an elaborate naval guerrilla base, <laughs> this whole operation. Uh, set up at Duwakit. Uh, he, from here, he defended the coast for the next two years with the Wabanaki. And by this time, the Wabanaki, they were skilled at building their own sailing ships. And they used this bay as their supply and repair station. So it's a, a probably, you know, sophisticated, rugged for the time. Quite an active place uh, throughout the uh, French and Indian Wars. And the French continued on there. A 1734 map shows them at Duwakhet and uh, Crabtree Neck, uh, which is also recorded as having the re remains of a French settlement later on. And then in 1751, several French inhabitants are reported as being there along with their ships. Um, there was another mention in 1754, but that's uh, dubious because of the um, the situation with the uh, French one or the English wanting to stir trouble um, with the French in order to get rid of the Acadians, and they were mostly gone by 1759 when the English settlers started moving in, though a few remained scattered about, and uh, then we have the subject of treasure. So this is from an account in 1902 by Helen Campbell Hill. She said, John and Josiah Bean's mill was near the head of Morancy stream for sawing lumber and their farm extending down to salt water. In 1841 on this farm near the shore, French gold was plowed up along with cases of silks and other dry goods which had been buried by the French for safekeeping during the French and Indian War. The beans made good use of the gold, building more homes for family, and even a tavern with a dance hall on the second floor owned by Eben Bean. And there are other accounts of this treasure. Uh, some of them state that it was uh, silver. Some say that there were uh, bones or a skeleton found with the treasure or that the gold was found in Sorrento. Um, we do know that the coins were dated 1704 or thereabouts and uh, was worth about $400 at the time. So in 1841, $400, that would be equal to about $15,000 today. In, and then I found um, just last night, actually, I found there was a, a an 1859 account written about the coins found there. This was by Joseph Williamson, who was writing about um, Castine and the old coins found there. And he writes that... Penobscot is not the only place in the eastern part of Maine where hidden money has been found. About 15 years ago, which would have been about 1844, in the town of Sullivan, at the head of Frenchman's Bay, a farmer, in plowing a neck of land in front of where the Ocean House now stands, 
turned out an old earthen pot containing nearly four hundred dollars worth of french crowns and half crowns all bearing date about 1724 and this was reported in the machias union in 1856 the coins wore a bright appearance but the pot crumbled in its contact with the plow this money was sold to a silversmith in boston but before it all found its way into the crucible william g stearns esq of harvard college secured some specimens which are preserved with his valuable collection of coins and um so there might still be specimens out there um i'll have to look up this guy william stearns and see what um what happened to his collection of coins uh, i did include some images of the 1724 french silver crown so that is what uh, some of these coins would have looked like um and they look pretty cool so uh, that <laughs> that is the history of duaquet um hopefully you've learned a few new things or at least a new perspective on the history of this place before the new england settlers came in it was a significant and active place and this part of our history shouldn't be hidden it should be illuminated as we can learn so much from it and appreciate these waters and this land and the richness of culture that much more thank you very much